The Burton and English Lecture Series has, in fact, been around the Ed School for a very long time, but we haven't used them um, recently. So this is a revival of an event that we hope will continue more often than it, than it has been given in the past. The English Lectureship in Secondary Education was established in 1924, four years after the Ed School itself was established officially, to commemorate Professor Alexander James Inglis and the work he did at the Ed School as a professor of secondary education. The Burton Lectureship was established a number of years later, quite a few years later, in 1953, by William H. and Virginia N. Burton. Um, and this lecture was particularly intended to focus on elementary education. So by putting them together and by reviving the Burton and English lectures tonight, we hope to honor not only elementary education and not only secondary education, but all of education. And the series of people who have given these lectures before is extraordinarily distinguished, and I'm not going to read the whole series because we would keep you here much too long. But the last published lectures that were Burton and English lectures were given by Lawrence Kremen in uh, the late 1980s, 1989, and subsequently published as Popular Education and Its Discontents. Tonight, as you know, our Burton and English lecturer is Michael Foyer, who I will introduce in a moment. But let me first introduce the people sitting up here on the panel who will be our initial discussants of Professor Foyer's lecture. Uh, the first person closest to my end of the table is Catherine Snow. Catherine is the Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Education at the Ed School. She's an expert on language and literacy and child development. She's written extensively on those topics and many others. I like to describe Catherine as one of our more multiply engaged faculty members, not simply at the Ed School, but at Harvard generally. She is multi-engaged and multifaceted and multi-perspectival, which is a <laughs> word she likes to use in all sorts of ways. Vanessa Fong, who is another multiply engaged in person, like many of our faculty at the Ed School, is an assistant professor of education here, and she studies the experiences of Chinese-only children and their families and how these shed light on a number of social, political, and psychological theories. We are very happy to have two of our doctoral students also on the panel with us tonight. Kathleen Guiney is a doctoral candidate in human development and psychology who studies the intersection of cognitive development and educational technology, particularly in two-way interactions between learners and technological tools during literacy activities. Michael Connell is an advanced doctoral student in the area of mind, brain, and education. Before coming to the Ed School, Michael studied computer science, robotics, <laughs> artificial intelligence, and cognitive science at MIT. And his work combines those fields with learning theory and practice in educational settings. So as you can see, we have an outstanding panel to comment on uh, a talk by an outstanding member of the education research community. And that is Dr. Michael Foyer. Mike is the executive director of the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education in the National Research Council of the National Academies in Washington, DC. He was also, as many of us in this room know, the first director of the Center for Education at the NRC, which did and does very pioneering work in terms of linking research to public policy questions and questions of educational practice. Before that, he was the founding director of the Board on Testing and Assessment. Before joining the NRC um, in 1993, 
Michael served as the Senior Analyst and Study Director of the Office of Technology Assessment, where he worked on a variety of educational and human resource projects, including educational technology, vocational education, performance standards, and educational testing. Michael received a PhD in public policy from the University of Pennsylvania, where his research focused on mathematical modeling and human resource planning in hierarchical organizations. He has a master's degree from the Wharton School. He studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the Sorbonne. Those of us who have worked with Michael in his work in the NRC, I think know Michael as somebody who has been a real pioneer in scanning the social and the behavioral sciences to mine the ways in which they can illuminate public policy problems in education. Um, I am tremendously grateful to Michael for being willing to give these lectures, and I am delighted that he is here for the first of what will be three lectures. Michael. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ellen. Uh, am I audible? Oh, you may regret that, but um, uh, this is a very, very uh, great honor and a, and, um, a thrill. I'm uh, very grateful to Ellen and thank all of you for um, taking some time out to uh, listen to what I have to offer here this evening. Um, uh, the topic is rationality in education policy. Uh, I hope that by next April you won't uh, come to the conclusion that this was not a rational uh, exercise. Um, I must say it's very special to be doing anything associated with the name of Lawrence Kremen, whom I never met to my great chagrin, but I um, was a great fan of that book, Popular Education and Its Discontents. I give it out as Christmas presents, and I require it as reading um, of my staff. And um, it's uh, quite stunning to me that, um, that I'm uh, following uh, that kind of um, scholar. Uh, one of uh, Kremen's concerns in that book, by the way, was the widespread belief that standards in American education had been falling, uh, a, a, a hypothesis that he actually disputed in the book. Um, I, I myself am now wondering about the fall of standards with respect to the Burton and English lectures, but let's not go into that. <laughs> um, so let me uh, tell you at first the storyline uh, and where I hope to be at the end of these three lectures uh, sometime in the spring. Uh, the basic storyline is that uh, cognitive science or cognitive psychology um, has revolutionized theories of teaching and learning uh, and has made a fundamental impact on how we understand complex organizations in certain policy areas. But ironically or surprisingly, cognitive psychology has not actually had much influence on the way we think about education policy. So it's a maybe complicated story, but I'm going to keep referring back to this little map I have. Um, cognitive psychology, or what I call the science of rationality, that is a strand of cognitive psychology that focuses on human information processing and decision making. Um, I I'm going to be trying to trace two new theories of learning that have emerged over the last uh, 30, 40 years. At the same time, cognitive psychology and the science of rationality has had a very strong influence on at least some other social sciences and on some other policy domains. And I will tell you a little bit about that uh, tonight. And the gap that I'm trying to fill in this series of lectures is this one designated here with the dotted arrow. Um, trying to establish a stronger link between what we have learned from the science of rationality uh, and how that might 
actually influence our understanding of, our shaping of, and our evaluation of education policies. Uh, in particular, I have my eyes on, uh, by the time I get to the third paper, uh, focusing on three very core aspects of education policy in the United States today, having to do first with standards, second with accountability, and third with the nature of education research. So those are the three areas within education policy that I hope to illuminate uh, using this map. Cognitive psychologists, I know, like to use words like maps and schema, so I'll try to do that every so often. <laughs> OK, so to start, um, I want to um, do a quick introduction to what I'm calling here the science of rationality. Um, so we're in the top box of my map. And um, I'm so glad to know that there are some real cognitive scientists here tonight who will correct me on my sloppy and sort of drifting language about what cognitive psychology and cognitive science are. Uh, but for me, it is essentially the systematic study of human thought and information processing and decision making. Or at least that's the part of cognitive psychology that I'm most interested in. Um, so what do I really mean by um, rationality? Well, to do that, I want to tell you two stories uh, to try to motivate the, the, the gist of things here. Um, I actually think that uh, these are stories that illustrate what I, what I consider to be very, very important insights about human thought and human behavior that were influenced by this cognitive revolution, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, so let me start with um, a story, a true story, uh, about a friend of mine I, uh, going back some 20 years now, who um, was himself a very well-trained clinical psychologist, but who was also a kind of mathematical prodigy and interested in games, and in particular games of chance, um, or games of chance and skill. He was a very good bridge player and a very good chess player, and he loved to go to Atlantic City to, to try to beat the house at blackjack um, in those days when you could actually count cards uh, and not get caught. He was, he was doing it for a while. And was. He also became interested, perhaps not surprisingly, in a very special um, uh, corner of the um, stock exchange of, of, of capitalism, which was called options trading. And I won't get into the details of what an option is. Um, it, it's a complicated, it's a complex task to understand options and to be an options trader. I mean, the basic idea is that an option is a contract between two parties that give the buyer the right but not the obligation to buy or sell a, a parcel of shares at some predetermined price uh, on or before a predetermined date, and that to acquire this right, the buyer pays a premium to the seller of the contract. Now, I, it's a whole other lecture to explain this, and in fact, I don't really know that I understand it that well. But the point of this is that my friend, who I refer to as R, um, used his mathematical skills and his interest in this options thing to develop a very elegant model uh, using uh, advanced statistics and computer simulations and a variety of um, tools. He developed a very elegant model. Uh, it took him some time. It took him some years of working on this. And he was able to demonstrate to himself and to investors, not, not myself, but members of his family and some other friends, that in retrospect, had he actually applied this model over some period of time, um, he would actually be, quote unquote, beating the house and making a ton of money. The way the model worked was you had to enter some some characteristics of the market, some data, and it churned around, and um, it then essentially spit out an instruction, buy or sell or do whatever you do with these options. Now, he was able to demonstrate to himself and to, to others with, uh, with a good bit of you know, uh, mathematical rigor that if one followed these, uh, those instructions, one could indeed win pretty big. The problem was that frequently the instruction that the model yielded 
was so unbelievable to him that his own judgment and his own knowledge of the market, which actually he needed in order to construct this thing in the first place, told him, this just can't be right. And he essentially violated his own model's uh, rule. Now, this, the irony here is actually pretty, pretty rich because, um, as I said, he was a clinical psychologist, and he happened to be a fan of a branch of clinical psychology called cognitive therapy. And so when he wasn't playing the options market, he was either working with patients, helping them uh, sort of realign their thinking in a way to um, enhance their own behavior. Uh, but while he was doing that, he himself was actually unable to um, overcome his own intuitions and his own judgments vis-a-vis -vis this model that he had uh, created. Um, and so the sad and true story is that um, he had too much knowledge, it got in the way, and ultimately he lost a lot of money, simply because he himself was not able to overcome his own intuitive judgment. So I stored that. I stored that away. Now we've been out of touch, and, and I haven't actually <laughs> told him that I'm writing this story. <laughs> um, I have to figure out how I do that. But um, but I but I stored that away as an example of. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we could talk about just from that story. I'm, I'm sure. But for me, the, the the main message here is that there are indeed times when formal reasoning should trump intuitive judgment. And that was the case. I mean, he had a formal model here that worked. And if he had been able to overcome his own instincts, he'd have been a very rich man. In fact, I told him once, why don't you just automate this whole thing? Get yourself out of the process. And I think there were rules about you know, the stock market that prevented him from actually doing that. And I think overall the problem was that he didn't want to give up his own intuitive judgments. That's the first story. Um, from which one might um, infer, perhaps a little bit too quickly, that formal modeling, formal reasoning, formal rationality is superior to intuitive judgment, and that's, that which, that's what should take precedence. But that would be, I'm, I'm sorry to say, that would just be a little bit too simple. And so, to tell you the other side of this story, I'm going to use something from the operations research literature, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But every time I think of this, I, I still get a kind of, I get a little thrill and a chill, and this goes and takes me back to my days of graduate school when I was actually learning about these things. Um, this is indeed a story that comes from the, the literature of operations research, um, and it has to do with uh, a situation in which a decision maker actually has all of the necessary information at his or her fingertips that, that, are, that would be required to make a perfectly rational judgment. And the story goes uh, something like this. Um, this familiar story. Given a number of cities where you are a traveling salesperson um, and your goal is to minimize the cost of travel and your, your objective is to visit your customers in, let's say, some number of cities and then return home. Um, it really is a very simple analytical exercise. So for example, um, I grew up in Queens. Footnote, my father actually was a traveling salesman. So it's kind of yet another thing that sort of gives me a little chill. But um, And suppose you had to go to Syracuse and Buffalo and Utica and a few other places and then get home. What do you do if you are a rational decision maker, what do you do? Well, you list out all of the various routes that you could take with their mileages, and then you pick the shortest route. So what's the problem? Oh, you don't know the answer to that. Good. Well, the problem is that that very simple question um, explodes very quickly into what I would call a combinatoric nightmare for the simple reason that those 10 cities that I listed there, if you actually started to jot down all the routes that were possible, um, 
you, you'd have to have a lot of paper and a lot of patience because just for those 10 cities, there are over 3 million uh, possible routes. Now, that suggests that if you're fast at writing these and you could actually jot down two routes a minute, if my computation is right here, it would take you 34 years to write, just to write out the complete list. And then, of course, you've got to scan this list, and then you probably want to do some error checking. And so by the time you have figured out the optimal solution to this problem, um, well, among other things, what has happened is that your competitor, who isn't particularly rational, let's just say, headed off to Utica. And so maybe by the time you figured out one one hundredth or one one thousandth of the possible routes that you have, uh, your competitor has taken away all the business and gotten home in time for Thanksgiving. Um, and if you think that's a big number, I've learned this from uh, Tolls, the cartoonist in the Washington Post, who always has that little guy in the corner, you know, with the little with the with the foot it's like a foot, it's the cartoon version of footnotes you know it's great try it for 15 cities uh, I think if my computation is right it would take uh, one and a half million years to write down all of the routes so the question becomes what is rational behavior in that kind of situation rational behavior obviously is not the objective pursuit of the shall we say, mathematically optimal solution. And it is indeed this kind of um, thinking that um, was at the core of um, the work of people like Herbert Simon, and in particular Herbert Simon. This is, I, I owe most of my thinking about this to the work of uh, Herbert Simon. I just want to remind you that what's really nice about that traveling salesman problem is that the decision maker has all of the information necessary. Not only that, the decision maker actually has um, enough knowledge of what the problem is. It doesn't require very sophisticated modeling. I'm not talking about, you know, this doesn't require a, 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 a multi-stage multi uh, system of equations. And it requires simple writing. And so he has the knowledge and the data. And pursuing the rational solution requires something other than actually carrying out uh, what, we are, what, we would, what we would expect to be um, the computational uh, solution. Um, in the real world, of course, most problems are not even, um, don't even have, we don't even have the luxury of having all the necessary data and having a relatively simple set of tasks. But here's one where even with those conditions, the question of what is rational needs to be, um, shall we say, rethunk. Now, um, the moral of the story here is from the traveling salesman problem, there are a lot of interesting, I think there are a lot of morals to that story. The one is the one I just said, that rational judgment is not the one that relies on formal analysis, and that in fact the, the, the traveling salesperson who uses a seat of the pants, a heuristic, an intuitive, an instinctive, some other kind of experiential knowledge is actually rational. That's point number one, pretty obvious by now. Point number two is that the optimal answer is probably less interesting than the realization that looking for it isn't such a smart thing to do. Um, by the way, the idea of optimization is um, a core tenet in at least some of the social sciences, and in particular in economics, where we assume that rationality consists of searching for some optimal something, whether it's the maximization of what we call utility, or if it's on the firm side, maximization of profit. But the whole idea of maximization or minimization of cost as in the case of the traveling salesman problem, is core, is central to economics, and here we have a very interesting challenge to that underlying assumption. Um, Herbert Simon uh, ultimately came to call this problem one of 
essentially bounded rationality. It's become a, a staple in, even in economics, people talk about bounded rationality these days, by which we mean behavior that is intendedly rational but limited by our cognitive constraints. Third point, or the fourth point, is that it's just an interesting thing to consider that because of computer science and because of the advent of high-speed electronic computing, most traveling salesman problems are now trivial. They actually can be solved, except if you get into really big numbers. Now, you saw what happens with 15 factorial. It goes up to the trillions. So try one with 100 cities. That would take even a supercomputer several days of crunching to come up with the solution, and so that the guy who left for Syracuse would probably even beat Big Blue <laughs> at that game. The bottom line here is that despite the fact that the decision maker has all the necessary information and knows what to do, it would not be rational to actually search for the optimal solution. Instead, and this was what led, led Simon to distinguish between two types of rational behavior, one in what he called objective or substantive rationality, and the other which he called procedural rationality. And the bottom line of this whole traveling salesman metaphor is the recognition of patterns, the reliance on a kind of seat of the pants heuristic, the, the uh, acceptance of an appropriate, an appropriate amount of deliberation. Um, and ultimately, most importantly, the acknowledgement that a reasonably good solution is actually better than the optimal solution. And so in Simon speak, um, this became known as satisficing, um, about which there's a lot of other things to be said. Um, so I'm up to now a little bit of a digression, and I don't want to do too much on this because I know that there are people here who actually know this history much better than I do. Um, this was happening, the, this awareness, this acknowledgement of the bounds to human rationality was happening at a time of great, um, a, a fascinating time actually in the history of science uh, because of the convergence of uh, computer science and the emergence of new theories and new ideas about human cognition. It was the time when behaviorism was being pushed aside uh, in, in its place was coming the idea of actually looking inside uh, the black box of human cognition, uh, whereas behaviorism relied on a more parsimonious model of observing inputs and outputs, but didn't pay too much attention to how, they, how the inputs were converted to outputs. That is, how stimuli actually were converted into thought and behavior. Um, the cognitive revolution actually started looking inside the black box. And I would argue that, and this is one of the really more, more beautiful aspects of this whole history, for which, by the way, I would, I would uh, refer you to Ellen's uh, book, The Elusive Science, in which some of this is covered very nicely, and Howard Gardner's uh, superb sort of biography of cognitive science, if you will, called The Mind's New Science. I think that's what it's called. Um, to make a short story long, the advent of computer technology enabled scientists to actually look inside the black box of human cognition and model very complex thought processes in a procedurally rational way. That is, because of computers, they could do some very fancy modeling. Um, I have to move along now to the next thing here, and um, you will find that I'm sure like many people who come and speak here, the concept of time is a very elusive science. Um, I'm up to the part of trying to draw this, this arrow between the science of rationality and what it actually did for learning theory, for which um, I rely on a few of the major reports of the National Research Council. Um, one that um, Lauren Resnick is associated with that was published in 1987. Um, that's uh, educated Education and Learning to Think. Uh, and another one that uh, 
appeared just a few years ago called How People Learn, which was a broader and more comprehensive summary of where cognitive science had come vis-a-vis -vis teaching and learning. A few, uh, I'm just going to pop in here with a few bullet points uh, so we can keep things moving, and I will tell you a few of the main findings, the highlights from this body of work. For example, and again, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to relate this back to these concepts of procedural rationality, pattern recognition, experiential, intuitive judgment, and so on. Learners cannot really understand what they read without making inferences and using information from other sources. I'm so glad Catherine is here because I, 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 I need to get straight on some of this. Um, similarly, they can't become good writers without engaging in complex problem-solving processes. Um, another finding from this body of work, that this whole idea of uh, doing the pattern recognition and developing that uh, a discipline of mind is actually a what Lauren referred to as a broad disposition that has to be cultivated. It doesn't come from the accumulation of, uh, as in perhaps in the older behaviorist model, in the accumulation of facts and pieces of knowledge. It comes from a whole uh, style of uh, teaching and, and the inculcation of a motivation to actually learn and accept these kinds of uh, patterns. Um, experts compared to novices. This was a big part of this literature. What distinguishes experts from novices in anything, whether it's chess or bridge or options trading? Um, it is that they are more likely to recognize, e experts are more likely to recognize meaningful patterns of information and to be able to act on those patterns. Um, and again, uh, what I'm suggesting here is that understanding, recognizing patterns is much different from solving a formal system of equations or, or a formal set of, of logical relations. Uh, and finally, there's, a, not finally, but, but another important feature of this body of research uh, is about the, gets into the debate about whether knowledge and intelligence and human thought is a set of skills that um, is situation dependent or transferable across domains. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful, even quite recent exchange in the literature between the folks who emphasize the so-called situated model and the folks who emphasize the transfer model. And very interestingly, but we don't have time to go into it, Simon, toward the end of his career, uh, got back to thinking about how important transfer is. Although you'd think that from a lot of what I was saying, he'd kind of emphasized the con contextual side, but he was worried that we were getting, I think, too, too tilted in that direction. Okay, so this is all very nice. And these theories, and Lauren's work, and a lot of the other work, Jim Greeno and, and a number of people, Bob Glazer, I mean, there was, a, there was a, a group of people who have revolutionized what we know about teaching and learning. Uh, the problem, of course, is that um, how do we really know that, it lo that, that all of these theories actually produce better learning? And that raises the, the great big what I call here measurement pickle. <laughs> um, and I don't have time for a, a, a big digression into the wilds of uh, psychometrics. And I wouldn't dare do that with Dan Koritz in the room anyway. Um, but I do, I do want to tell you what the, what the nub of the problem was as this emergent cognitive science was essentially was hitting the street. And that is, on the one hand, it was pretty clear that the psychometrics we had the tools we had to measure learning were designed from a different era when we were focused on behaviorism. That is at least, that's the drill. That's the riff that we have been hearing about psychometrics. And so therefore, it, wouldn't, it didn't really apply to the measurement of cognitive processing um, that's all about, that, 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 that's what this revolution is all about. On the other hand, if you change the measure, then you have, a, you have a, a tough battle convincing people 
that these new theories of learning are doing something better than the old theories of learning because you don't have a comparable measure to use. And this is a dilemma that I have to tell you, the board on testing and assessment, and I think many of the people in the measurement community, and you've got the, the, the top of the line here, uh, have been struggling with. Um, on the one hand, maintaining some rigorous set of valid and reliable measures that can actually produce for the public, for parents, for somebody, some information about whether kids are learning more or less than they used to, while at the same time recognizing that the measures we have, which do a fairly decent job of that, don't really get at this, get at the core of what we now consider to be important about teaching and thinking and learning. This book, Knowing What Students Know, actually um, had that as its main theme was an attempt to marry um, new statistical techniques with technology, with uh, emerging theories of cognition, uh, and resulted in uh, actually some good news. That is, we're not there yet, uh, but there is hope for a psychometrics that can do um, a decent job of measuring cognitive processing, information processing, and produce reliable measures, scores, if you will, uh, that can be used for the purposes of comparing across different uh, regimes of teaching, uh, and that can do that uh, in, uh, and you'll forgive me here, in a procedurally rational way. That is, this country, no country, can afford to spend $1,000 per pupil to do the full-blown interview and cognitive measurement that would really get to the core of all of the complexity of what's going on in a child's head. So you've got to do this in some procedurally rational way. And we think that with technology, uh, with new technology, that might be possible. So I commend that book modestly. Um, okay, so I, I, I don't know how am I doing on, on time, and I don't see Sean, so I'm just going to keep going until somebody stops me. Am I, am I okay? Yeah, good. Uh, I'm up to this part of the picture now. I, I've tried to make a case for how cognitive psychology has influenced learning theory. Now I want to switch gears and take you away from education briefly and tell you about, or at least introduce you to, this is mostly an audience, I suppose, of educators and, and, and folks in education, so you may not know much about this, but that, and I'm going to spend some more time on this in the next lecture, so maybe you'll come back. And that is how some of these theories of bounded rationality and the complexity of decisions faced by human problem solvers uh, actually led to a very interesting revision to some basic theory in economics and in organization theory and how it has actually been applied in some policy domains. So that's kind of where we are in the story here. Um, It wasn't just how people learn, which is where some of the cognitive revolutionaries went. People like George Miller and uh, Dick Neisser and uh, Norbert Wiener and others uh, got very deep into the issue of individual level cognitive processing. Simon actually took this also in another direction and asked fundamental questions about the organization of social and economic activities, and whether that organization could in some way be explained using these principles of what, what would be called rational decision making. Um, here I'm relying mostly on the work of um, Oliver Williamson, who is uh, an economist at Berkeley who was actually a student of Herb Simon's uh, way back when and uh, who is responsible for um, a whole new, essentially a whole new direction in, in economics, which uh, to, my, to for my money hasn't taken on as much as I would have hoped, but, but has still made a considerable dent in the neoclassical system. Um, it, would, it would really be beyond I mean, it, it, would, it would not be procedurally or in any other way rational for me to try to do a full-blown explication of Ollie's framework here. So let me, again, try to give you a few highlights. 
the central question in Williamson's work is why are certain transactions organized through a hierarchy while others are organized through the equivalent of a market-based, almost atomistic contracting mode? And it, it, this takes a lot of mental work to just get to that question. So don't, don't feel bad. You don't really follow this along. But the, the, the basic question here is, and the, and the point that, that undergirds this whole framework is that limited human cognitive capacity, bounded rationality, coupled with or faced with objectively complex decisions and problems, at least warrants um, attention to how transactions are organized. So, for example, one of the predictions that comes from Williamson's framework, which owes a lot of its, you know, which has its roots in the Simon revolution, is that internal organization, as opposed to contracting, uh, enables parties engaged in repeated transactions to deal with uncertainty and complexity in a sequential and adaptive fashion and economizes on their bounded rationality. Um, it leads to some very interesting assumptions and different predictions that then you get from the neoclassical theory of the firm and from a conventional organization theory. So without going into all the, the details here, because I am trying to be a little conscious of the time, uh, I'm just giving you three examples here, and I'm only going to talk about one, actually, in which this framework has actually made a difference to, it, to the way we think about some very fundamental policy questions. And what I'm going to tell you is a quick story about uh, a problem in education, actually, in a funny sort of way. It has to do with training that is provided by uh, profit-making firms. Now, we all know that a lot of firms out there seem to be spending money to provide ongoing education and training for their workforce. And this is considered to be a good thing. Uh, but along comes neoclassical economics and says, wait a second, that can't be. You know, the, the joke about The Economist is that if he sees a $50 bill on a sidewalk, he walks past it because if it was really a $50 bill, somebody would have already picked it up. <laughs> um, but so the, 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 um, the, the idea that firms are Paying for training is okay. We have data on that. Whether they're actually making the investment or whether they're taking it out of the workers' uh, wages, essentially, is the core problem. And Gary Becker, who won the Nobel Prize for this, among other insights, demonstrated back in the 50s that if the skills that were being provided were a general of a general nature, that is, that they could be used in other firms besides the one where it was being where the, where the training was happening, um, the firm would not have an investment, uh, not have an incentive to pay for it uh, because of the simple risk associated with the worker being poached by a competing firm which wasn't paying for the uh, training, and you can sort of see the gist of this argument. So um, I got my hands on some data uh, in, this, in the late, uh, in the early 80s. And we fiddled around with a model that actually was based on Williamson's framework and thought more carefully about under what circumstances, given the nature of the transaction that exists between workers and their, and their employers, would one actually uh, see perhaps a different kind of outcome? That is, under what circumstances would firms actually be, uh, would there be an incentive for them to pay for that training? And it turns out that if you take seriously this business of bounded rationality and complexity and a few other interesting attributes of, of uh, human relations, you end up with a very different prediction. And the prediction is that they will indeed pay for some of the general training, and they'll pay for some of the more specific uh, human capital development as well. And suffice it to say that this is a very interesting irony because Gary Becker, of course, uh, the sort of uh, uh, stalwart of the University of Chicago School of Economics uh, isn't exactly a big fan of 
of government intervention and collective action to solve market failure problems. But if you follow his model and you believe that, that investment in ongoing education and training is a public good, you end up with the conclusion that the only way you'll get it is through some kind of government-imposed system or government-provided system, because individual profit-making firms won't have that incentive. In fact, in 1972, in France, they passed a law. Now, I don't know whether they were influenced by Becker's reasoning or just by what, what French typically do in situations like this, is they, they regulate. And so they passed a law that said any firm that had more than 15 employees had to invest a certain share of its annual budget on formation permanente, the on ongoing education and training. Um, the irony, of course, is that if you take seriously this organizational failures framework, you end up with the prediction, well, gee, in fact, the firms will have an incentive to pay for it, and you don't need the collective action. I've never actually tried to challenge Becker on this sort of one-on-one, -on -one, but, but that was the, that's the idea. To make a long story short, this is a cognitively inspired analysis of an important area of public policy of which there are many interesting examples. Antitrust, vertical integration, preventive maintenance, um, the whole literature on efforts and incentives and uh, what, what to be done to improve employee performance in various types of settings. Uh, these have now all come in for a revisiting through the lens of what I'm calling the cognitive inspiration. That's kind of um, where we are today. This, by the way, is just some of the literature that I relied on to get me this far, but there's a much longer list. And I want to just say again that where, where I hope to be next time and then in April, um, with only two or three exceptions that I know of, this whole attempt to bring to bear on, on education policy that which we have learned from the new theories of teaching and learning um, hasn't really happened. The exceptions, you'll be glad to know, are attributable in one case to uh, your very own uh, Richard Murnane, who wrote a truly marvelous article with Richard Nelson in 1984 that touched on this, and it had a lot, to, and, it, and it started uh, people thinking about this, but, it, but it's very underutilized. Um, and the other one, that, the other two that I know of are Ernie House, who is now retired from the University of Colorado, who wrote a very interesting article in The Education Researcher, actually trying out Ollie, Ollie Williamson's organizational failures framework with respect to understanding school reform. But that was it. It was a one shot, and that was the end. So I'm hoping here that um, next time, if, if you come back, and actually even if you don't come back, because I will come back, um, what I want to do is um, keep pressing on this. Uh, I'm going to develop in a little more detail how that organizational failures framework works, and then I'm going to talk about education policy vis-a-vis -vis its very objective complexities and try to make the argument that it is an arena that is ready for a cognitively inspired um, reanalysis. Um, in closing, let me just say that one of the things that we have learned from cognitive research is the importance of trial and error in the way people develop expertise. Um, I hope this hasn't been a trial for you and that you will correct my errors. <laughs> of what he's talking about, which is all too common in education research, is the way in which it's really been isolated from these very important developments in other fields. And that's a huge phenomenon in this problem, in this area that we need all to worry about. We have four discussants, each of whom has been given five minutes maximum, beginning with Catherine. And then Michael will have a chance to respond if he would like. And then we will open the floor to questions. Catherine. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this is actually a very hard paper to respond to, I should say, um, in part uh, because Michael gave me a copy of it in advance, which is, which meant that I, I had to read it, but then I really wished I hadn't read it. 
One advantage of reading it, however. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. <laughs> well, no, because it's so much more fun just to listen. But one advantage of reading it was that I realized that he used another example of uh, a policy domain in which uh, this, this sort of cognitive r bounded rationality approach has been used to good effect that might, had he known about, about the, the serious problems with the big dig, might have been a better choice <laughs> in the discussion here. It's the preventive maintenance uh, uh. example and why and when do you actually do preventive maintenance and why and when do you uh, cover up the fact that your uh, major public works project is leaking for seven years before you let anybody know about it. Um, so let me start with the end of the talk. Um, let me back up and say, when I was first introduced to Michael, maybe, I don't know, a long time ago, by Barbara Torrey, he said, well, she's, he's sort of like a combination of Alan Greenspan and Jerry Seinfeld. So, <laughs> So I hope you've got that. I should be that rich. Got that, got that flavor. Um, the, here's a framing of the, the story about workplace training. Um, that it's a story that Gary Becker, uh, a problem that Gary Becker approaches purely as a problem of economics. And as Michael has displayed, um, when you approach it purely as a problem of economics, you get to an analysis that isn't entirely uh, coherent with the realities of the situation, that if you ap approach it as a problem of economics, I mean, obviously it is economics, but, if, but also as a problem of human resources that are not purely viewed economically but also viewed organizationally, um, you get a much richer view. Now this is a perfect example of what we would call integrative thinking. Um, in, it's what uh, S109 is trying to um, promote among uh, students here at the Graduate School of Education. And I would argue that in order to do an even better job of that, it would be valuable to think about the contributions to decision making in workplace training, let's say if we want to take that as our example, from uh, an anthropological perspective, a perspective of, a social psychological perspective of building, uh, building cohorts of people who operate with one another in a variety of different settings rather than purely as workers, also as co-students, also as students and teachers, that every time you add in a new kind of disciplinary, relevant disciplinary take on a problem like that and really integrate it with the previous disciplinary uh, perspectives, you probably get a richer and maybe even a better handle on, on the problem. So let me go back to the first piece of this. Now I'm, I'm my take on, on cognitive, on the history of cognitive uh, psychology is, of course, the take of someone who, who views that through the parochial lens of language. And those of us who study language development really don't think that computers, that the, the computer model was the right model for uh, revolutionizing, nor, the, nor actually historically the model that did revolutionize thinking, Pasche uh, Howard Gardner. Um, we think it all had to do with Chomsky. We think it all had to do with the claim that language was not, a, is not, producing language is not a process of putting words one after the other, but of planning in deep structures, in producing hierarchical relationships among uh, items on the surface, and that this complex net of relationships between a deep structure and a surface structure, between an internal representation and the and the necessarily linear external re uh, representation was really the insight that led us to think about um, cognition in a different way, in a way that was not stimulus response bound, that was not input output bound, but that was uh, structured and that was characterized by rules and inevitably because rules are, are constructed by learners on the basis of inadequate data, um, characterized by incorrect, by, by, uh, incorrect attributions, by misconceptions, by rules that go too far or that stop too soon. Um, so the problem with the computer from the point of view of a language analyst is that, is that computers are too digital. And, you know, they're too much like baseball. Uh, where everything is either it's an out or it's a hit or it's, you know, everything, ha there is a decision about what category it's in. 
Um, and language isn't like that. The characteristic of language is that you have to preserve a huge amount of deniability. No, no, I wasn't asking you to do that for me. I was just inquiring as to whether you might do that for me. Um, or I wasn't a threat. It was just a warning. Right? So the essence of language is uh, language is like football. You know, like a, a, a few inches make a huge difference in football. Um, whereas a few inches make no difference at all in, in uh, baseball, right? It's in or it's out. You're on base or you're off base. It doesn't, close doesn't count. And um, so given that, I think um, language sort of offers us a different kind of a way of thinking about cognition that's much more um, probabilistic and much more graded. And that would be fun to, uh, to apply to major problems in organizational reform and analysis. Right. I I had I was trying to imagine um, applying the, th the theories and ideas of rational cognition, both in terms of teaching students to think rationally, and in terms of crafting rational educational policy. So I'm I'm going to talk about first. Um, the issue of what do we teach students? If we have an idea of rational cognition, um, what, what do we teach them? And um, I'll talk about how we can think about the purpose of education. If you want to teach students to think rationally, you have to think about what you want them to think rationally about and what their final product will be. If you're talking about the two examples, um, the, the stock trader, the stock options trader, um, what is your goal? When, if you want to educate your children and you want them to be rational people, what, what is the goal of that rationality? Is it to maximize profit? Is it to have a, an economy that's healthy? Is it to have a good citizen who will give money to progressive political causes? Uh, is it to have a, a citizen who will take care of his or her family? Uh, um, and, and, and when you think about how you reach these goals, there's, uh, to some extent, having someone be able to respond rationally to situations such as, for instance, knowing how to design a computer program to tell you when to sell stocks, or, for instance, having the emotional discipline to keep yourself from interfering with that program and from, from trying to do your own haywired uh, approach to stock options. Um, to some extent, um, th this kind of rationality is good and useful if, if your goal is to have a person who can make a lot of money in the stock market. But uh, you, one wonders, is that the goal of education? Um, it's clearly not the goal of public education. We're, we're not really trying to produce, uh, have everyone be able to beat the stock market because that's actually impossible for everyone to beat the stock market. Someone has to win and someone has to lose. So what are we trying to educate people for? And um, in, in a way, this kind of, um, the, the question of what we're trying to educate people for Will, will define the kind of education that we provide. Uh, one, uh, one, one of the things I do in my research, I look at Chinese youth who study abroad. So I follow them. Actually, a lot of them, and I myself, had encountered this very problem of you have many cities to travel to. Um, how, what, do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you manage this? And when you think internationally, especially for these students, um, they, they're not just thinking of how to minimize the, the cost of their ticket, though that's very important. They're also thinking of, well, in which country am I likely to get fingerprinted before I, I, I'm able to enter? In which country am, do I have to get a transit visa, which is going to be difficult? What am I, as a Chinese student, as a member of a third world country that the United States and uh, Western Europe and Canada and Australia has a lot of prohibitions against? What am I going to face at different airports? A and often the goal is to be able to get it. At which airport am I likely to be detained and possibly turned back? Maybe it's worth a, a little extra money to avoid those airports so that I can actually get where I'm going. And, and when you look at all the factors that go into making rational decisions that fulfill your goals, you, you, you really see that there's a lot more than just thinking rationally that has to be taught. And, and also there's a question of cultural models. Uh, there, um, Claudia Strauss and Roy Dandrati and Naomi Quinn uh, were, were psychological anthropologists who pioneered this idea of how we use these heuristics um, 
as um, cultural schemas, we, you know, how do we decide where, um, how to sch how to schedule a flight itinerary? We have cultural schemas that are defined by what our cultural values. And if our cultural values not being detained at the airport or not being fingerprinted, that's going to perhaps be more important than the, our cultural value of saving as much money as we can on a plane ticket. So the question, uh, the uh, the question of how to teach rationality and rational thought is really dependent on a lot more variables. Um, if, if we had taught this stock, stock options trader um, more emotional intelligence about how to, how to be disciplined and how to not interfere with the machine when he knew that it was more rational than he was, perhaps that was the key to this poor guy's education. That could have made him much richer than he is now. When I was doing research in China, I was often asked by Chinese educators who were dissatisfied with the Chinese educational system because it was so different from the Western educational system. Um, you know, how can China compete in this capitalist world system dominated by the West if our educational system really teaches our students memorization and very basic, very elemental levels of um, calculation rather than this more creative, holistic, heuristic approach that, uh, that, 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 that uh, the West seems to be better at. And and they said, you know, how can our students survive? And and when and I thought back to all the Chinese students I knew in at Harvard, and um, at how many of them were incredibly successful, and even more so than their American peers, even though they had come from a system where basically everything they had been taught had to be thrown out. Um, when they enter the, an American educational system. They, especially humanities and social sciences in China is completely different from, from uh, American humanities and social sciences education. It consists of memorization, and the stuff that they memorize is actually different stuff than the stuff we will memorize. They, they can recite Mao Zedong thought. They can recite Deng Xiaoping's thought. They, 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 they memorize these texts and, and the proper politically correct way to respond to them. That is often politically incorrect correct by American standards. And, and, um, and, but what do they, when they come to, to the United States, how come they can still thrive and succeed when they've had a totally different education? And oh, my answer was that, well, actually, what really mattered was, was that they learned discipline. They learned it, to control their desire for leisure and pleasure and happiness in the short run. And they learned to postpone gratification and work really hard and stay up all night if they had to and you know, not go out with their friends and not go out drinking and not go to parties and just study really hard. And, and in that, and, and even though they had to throw out everything they had learned uh, um, in terms of how to think about problems and uh, you know, even the content of what they had learned, they, they, they spent so much time with the discipline they, that they had learned in the Chinese educational system, which is incredibly intense and grueling, competitive, that they thrive just because of their emotional intelligence and their discipline, their, their ability to discipline their desires. Um, and, and, and there's so much of that that goes beyond cognition, that goes into education. Um, and, and, and this leads to the question of, well, what do we do about a rational, trying to use rationality to define how we should have policy? How, how, do, you, how do you have educational policy that is rational? And, and that leads me back to the issue of, well, rationality is defined by what your goals are. If your if your goal if the goal of the education educational system is to provide good citizens who will help you have a good society, it's a very different goal than if the goal of the educational system is to stratify and determine who gets to be rich and who gets to be poor. And um, if you try to implement uh, a system where uh, where you're going to have um, you're going to be able to test for different kinds of ability and test for um, different, uh, different levels of ability, of ability to stratify people into different socioeconomic positions, um, you're, you're going to encounter a problem because, because many of the things that create good citizens and good people are not things that can be tested. And um, it, it's very difficult to test for things that 
need people to be the kind of people we want them to be. It's much easier to test for very basic things like math problems and how many vocabulary words you know. And if your goal is to have a system where you can evaluate who can go into which socioeconomic niche, um, it's often just easier to, to, to go with that, uh, that test of cognition and that test of what people have learned. Dr. Foyer has identified reconceptualizing educational policy as an important need in today's society and interestingly suggests applying cognitive theory in this pursuit. To supplement Dr. Foyer's presentation, I'd like to provide additional context about the development of early computers and the computer's role within cognitive science research. First generation computers were designed to perform mathematical calculations as an improvement over the mechanical adding machines of the early 20th century. Just prior to World War II, John Attensoff and Clifford Berry began building the first electronic computer. It performed addition and subtraction logically, so it carried out unions and intersections with binary numbers, rather than by mechanically counting spokes on a dial. Invention in this area was encouraged because people, especially the Department of Defense, which sponsored the ENIAC project, had a growing need to perform co complicated calculations at a rapid pace. A breakthrough in these new electronic calculating machines came about in 1945 when John von Neumann described how a binary program could be stored in a computer. This stored com program would enable the computer to alter its operations based on the results of previous steps. In other words, it could make the computer smart. In 1947, with Bell Laboratories' invention of the transistor, second generation computers were born, replacing the large vacuum tube based first generation computers. In addition to performing calculations, these second generation computers were capable of sorting and printing large amounts of data. The connection between computers and cognitive science is artificial intelligence, or AI. This field has two related yet distinct goals. One, to use computers to mimic human performance, such as performing mathematical calculations or playing chess and two, to model human thought processes. It's important to keep in mind that just because a computer can perform the same task as a human doesn't mean the computer is performing it in the same way. Therefore, these two goals may have different outcomes. In 1950, Alan Turing proposed a test for determining whether an intelligent machine had been successfully created. Turing had great vision, especially considering that the first programming language, which would allow people to make computers perform more complicated functions than simple calculations and sorts, wasn't invented until 1956, two years after Turing's death. Since that time, AI has revealed much about human mental processes. I think the most important contributions arise from computer models of neural networks. Neural networks are distributed systems where information is stored not in individual nodes, but rather in the connections between nodes. Among other things, neural network models have provided insight into human memory and language processes. Computer models of neural networks are a useful place to study mental processes because in this virtual environment, researchers can specify the exact input and feedback the network receives. In addition, researchers can change or delete portions of a network at will to determine the respondent effects. It hopefully goes without saying that neither of these techniques can be used when studying human participants. Hopefully, with this added context, I've provided support for Dr. Foyer's ascension, assertion that experiments with computers can contribute to our understanding of cognition and learning.
As a final additional comment on Dr. Foyer's presentation, I'll mention one slight caution. I want to express concern about perpetuating an economic or industrial metaphor of education. Unlike industry, education does not have easily visible, tangible products, and often the real products aren't recognized until years after an educational intervention. Our current schooling paradigm, which was established during the Industrial Revolution, may not be adequate for today's world. While considering ways to reform our schools, one can argue, as Dr. Foyer just did, that in today's information age, it would be prudent to capitalize on recent research in cognitive science. Perhaps we can take a lesson from artificial intelligence and think of education as a distributed network, where each node in the network is unique, yet all are essential and valuable. Using this metaphor, the end goal of education is not to generate masses of nodes, but rather to build a strong network of connections that promote more productive learning and a fruitful society. Great. I should, I should start by saying that, is this thing on? that I'm very enthusiastic about uh, science-based research and education and cognitive models and um, using cognitive science in educational applications and in um, kind of rational policy making that you're talking about. So I'm sympathetic in that sense. Um, like Catherine, I had some difficulty responding to this paper, but for different reasons, I think. Um, first, because I, I am sort of in the uh, same spirit of this um, approach using cognitive science, um, not be and not because I had too little to say, but because I had too many things to say, all of which are probably in one of the books you've written you, uh, at the end at the National Research Council, so you can just refer me to a page uh, there. Um, so I wanted to say something that wouldn't uh, just be sort of mundane. Um, one of the things that I've, let's see, so I was at MIT before coming here, as uh, Dean Logman said in the introduction, and uh, one of the interesting things about being in, in such a scientifically oriented place is that um, the, the scientific perspective is just part of the frame that you look through uh, the world at, and you're not really aware of it. And coming to the ed school, um, I found quickly that that's not really the case here. Um, not everyone is really um, interested in being sort of approaching education from a scientific perspective, and there are many other um, issues that are not necessarily um, addressable from a scientific perspective, such as questions of value, what do we do? Um, so one thing I got good at is kind of pushing my assumptions and my frame to the, f to the front and being able to, to look at it. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to comment on uh, this idea that uh, cognitive psychology is the study of rational thought and how that fits into this rational policy making idea. So um, one thing that I've come to understand is that um, cognitive psychology is, is a study of rational thought and decision making, but it's not the study of rational thought and decision making. It's, it's obviously from a specific perspective uh, and embodies particular assumptions. Specifically, uh, in terms of method, the assumption is that we can look at behavior and we can um, infer the mechanisms of, of mind and brain that are underlying that behavior and that that's a reasonable way to go. Um, and second, there's the assumption that any description we come up with for what's going on in the mind, as long as it accounts for you know, what we're doing to the kid in the intervention and what's coming out um, in, in terms of behavior performance, um, is an equally good model with any other uh, model that we have. So, excuse me. Uh, the problem is that um, that can be very useful in engineering, and in fact has, and that's where um, a lot of these applications really got a lot of uh, momentum back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was in things like expert systems to solve um, problems that formerly only people could solve. The problem is that even though it's, it, it's got a lot of utility in an engineering sense, um, as Kathleen said, it may not give us any real insight into how our own minds and brains work. Um, and in fact, that the mechanisms that we actually use um, in terms of uh, learning, when you know children learning, the mechanisms that they use to learn and solve problems uh, may be quite alien to us, even though each of us has our own mind and think we know how it works pretty well. Um, and this is not just sort of an esoteric concern. Um, there are many <coughs> findings coming out of neuroscience that suggest that our minds don't work the way that we think that they work. Um, for instance, there's research on what's called confabulation, where Experimenters manipulate a situation to cause a specific behavior, like two people fighting with one another, where they've turned the heat up, 
And then if you ask the people, why were you fighting with one another, they'll give you some reason about something the other person did, which they didn't do. And so there's this constant narrative going on about um, how our own minds work and what our reasons are for our behaviors. And a lot of that classical cognitive um, science research is based on that kind of data, uh, behavioral data and self-report data. Um, so that's one issue, one concern. A second concern is that whereas behavioristic models were too simple in the sense that they didn't include any model of the mind or internal uh, data structures and representations, the models that, we, um, that, that came out of the cognitive revolution are a little too complex, a little too powerful uh, in the sense that they can model anything we can, as long as we throw enough resources at the problem. And so we now lose the falsifiability, which is so critical to being a scientific theory. If you can't disprove the theory, then it's not um, scientific. And in addition, now we have multiple different paradigms for trying to understand how the mind and brain work, as Kathleen mentioned a couple of them. Um, the, the one of Simon and Newell uh, was um, dominant probably from the 50s through, uh, is still, still quite dominant. Um, is very different from the neural network models that Kathleen mentioned. And the problem now is how do we distinguish between these different models when we're trying to relate them to human behavior and ask uh, which one is a better model of human behavior and therefore which model should we be using to inform our teaching and in fact which one should we, we be using to inform our uh, policy making if we're going to take that rational approach. Um, so those are two concerns that I have. A third one is that um, just comes from my own experience in artificial intelligence. Back, and this isn't my experience, but back in the 60s, um, Jerry Sussman, who's now, who was then a, an undergraduate actually at MIT, uh, went to work for Marvin Minsky, who was one of the grandfathers of artificial intelligence, and um, said, you know, I want to do some project this summer. What should I do? And Minsky said, well, there's this problem of, of how vision works that's kicking around. Why don't you solve that this summer? And uh, you know, that was, what, 40, 40 years ago, and we haven't really made all that much progress since. Um, and when I went into artificial intelligence, I was drawn to it because the way that that uh, discipline is built, uh, or sort of, yeah, build the people is that we're studying, we're one branch of, stu uh, of the study of human cognition. Um, and after studying it for seven years, I came to understand that it's very sort of isolated within its own little world of, world of um, principles and rules. I think this is what Jerry Sussman ran into and what the vision research is running into is that they've created a paradigm. If it's the wrong paradigm, you're never potentially going to be able to connect with the truth of the matter, which is how our minds and brains work. And so this, these are the three concerns that I have is that um, if we put a, a lot into um, an approach to either teaching um, or to policy making that is based on a specific model, what happens if that model turns out to be completely wrong. And even though it may have some utility, you know, even today we know a lot about um, the mind and brain from cognitive science, but we have to ask um, where are the revolutions in terms of outcomes and that sort of thing. There's still a gap between the principles that we're offering to teachers and what they should be doing uh, in class every day. So I think that's probably about five minutes, and I that would be... <laughs> Well, look, thank, thank you very much for these comments. I took notes. I hope I can uh, engage with you all later by email and all of that. And I, I, I suppose it would be uh, also only fair to have other people ask questions or get in on this. I just want to tell you one story in, uh, in reaction to Catherine's point about how language is actually much more complicated than what computers can do. Your example of, well, no, no, I didn't really mean that. You know, I, I, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings by by saying that, I meant something else. It reminded me of a, of a story that is attributed to the great now um, deceased uh, philosopher Sidney Morgenbesser, um, who was sitting in an audience, I think something like this, and listening to a linguist uh, expound the theory about how there are no, th that there are many languages in which the juxtaposition of a positive and a negative turns into a negative, and that there are many languages in which two negatives become a positive, and that there are no language, and of course with two positives, are always a positive, but there was no language that we knew of where two positives made a negative. And Morgan Besser was sitting there and he just said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's probably something that a computer... I, wouldn't really, I mean, you'd have to be a pretty classy programmer to come up with that <laughs> instruction. So, look, I'm, I'm, uh, there's, there's so much here that my, my friends have offered back. I can't answer all of these things. There's, 
So uh, up to you, Ellen, where you want to go with this now. Are there questions? Comments? Yes. Some domains where rational calculation is both possible and also desirable, yeah. and there are other domains where it isn't possible. And students need to understand the difference. Two, two examples would be that, uh, thank God, the civil engineers know how to get the bridge right the first time around. You know, the Lenny's Acre Bridge is very beautiful and it stood up so far. I assume that there were civil engineers who knew how to make calculations about it. People have been forced to the bridge so they will stand up and they have that body of knowledge. Uh, another example would be William Nordhaus at Yale, the economist, who's been calculating models of the optimal emission of greenhouse gases to the environment, the optimal rate at which we can uh, emit them. Right? It's a silly exercise because the complexity of the atmosphere is such we don't know where we're going to reach, you know, tipping points and irreversibilities. So in that case, Simon is right, rules of thumb are the way to go. Prudent to say we're going to cap greenhouse gases. We don't know how much the atmosphere can save. So the Zayden Bridge is very different from the atmosphere. The students need to know that. Uh, that that that's that's really very interesting and very important. And I haven't actually been thinking about how do you teach people rationality. But I have to tell you that this this gets into a complicated conversation about whether Simon's theories about rationality are intended as descriptive, that is, in the positive scientific model, or whether they are intended as normative, that is, what what should you do if you want to be rational, as opposed to what do human beings do when they are faced with these complex decisions. Uh, I think Simon was not was was not suggesting that um, we shouldn't, uh, you know, teach civil engineering in all of its formality. I think he was saying that there are complex decisions where that kind of formalism just doesn't apply. So I think you have that right. But I, I would not want to go on record as suggesting that we build bridges using intuitive judgment. Uh, although I understand that around here, um, <laughs> there's the big dig. You you have you have given me a new a new sense of what the word leak means in Washington. It's a very different anyway. So I, I agree with that comment. Other questions? Well, people can save them for the next time and the next time. Uh, thank uh, you way, for I coming have hand, and thank you, Michael. Handouts if, if you Great. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.